presentation. Here's a new quote on the topic of quotes that are being used again and again and again. The truth never goes out of style. You can quote me on that. <laughs> so if it's true, it's still relevant. It's still relevant. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And so, um, so we, we gather together to be reminded of what we already know because it's in our consciousness. And so often we hear from people who come to these studies that it's, it's, like, a, it's like a type of deja vu that they have in encountering the teachings because they're like, ah, oh, it just seems like I've, I know this, you know, I, I know this inside. I already knew this. And um, <clears throat> so I preface, you know, a, a pretty conceptually basic class in that way, um, because it's important we arrive with the consciousness who is the one that brought you here. <laughs> the consciousness is the one that brought you here. And someone I know uh, once has shared, has shared and sometimes in classes, somebody I know, that uh, early on in Gnosis when, when he was attending meditation retreats and really struggling with that because at first you know we're out in life and we're living the personality and we're living more instinctively and then we go for a weekend to just sit and be still and observe the breath and be with yourself it can it can be very challenging <clears throat> and and what was it that person said they had some kind of he says a lot of stuff he says a lot of stuff but he had some kind of uh internal experience oh, that. Of, you know vision oh. in meditation mm. that yeah. that's that spoke on the behalf of the uncomfortable one who said what was i was struggling and struggling and, and having difficulty i uh fell asleep and had an experience i got out of the body and the instructor stood up to give a speech and it was like a big deal and he said um everybody's going to have to work much harder. And then he just sat back down and got put his blanket on and curled up and went back to sleep. And I got, it, it really triggered me. And so I was in your in, internal, experience. in my internal experience. Yeah. And I said, wait a minute, don't you understand the person that committed to come here to sit in this meditation is not the one that has to sit in this meditation. And that was it. Mm -hmm. We have different aspects of ourself or eyes that ones that want to do the work ones that want to put forth effort and then notice who it is that carries it out mm -hmm. do we do it with a, a grumpy attitude do we do it with like this isn't fair you know and that applies to all things of life mm -hmm. that? yeah yeah that applies to all things of life and so a big focus for today is yeah who are we and and the answer to that can change because who 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 motivated him to go to the retreat was not the same one sitting there in that moment struggling. <clears throat> so who are we is is a question we need to repeatedly ask ourselves. You know who who am I being? Who who am I being in this moment? And am I being the consciousness? And that's what Gnosis constantly invites us to do to understand. We are fundamentally an essence. We have essential nature. We, that's fundamentally what and who we are. And a lot gets overlaid over that, our, our expectations, <clears throat> our desires, our attachments, our theories, our, our beliefs that we haven't even verified through direct experience, but that we will kill and die for. You know, there's a lot that gets overlaid over that essential nature. And this quintessential quote from the Gnostic Master Samuel Vior says that Gnostic psychology differs fundamentally from conventional psychology because it approaches the human psyche from the point of origin, the essence, the buddhata, or consciousness, the seed of the soul, divine intelligent principles which belong neither to time nor to the mind. <clears throat> So we, we talk about the mind in different ways in Gnosis and in certain other languages, 
like Pali, the language of the Buddha, there were many, many different words for mind because there was a much deeper understanding of what the mind is. And, and so to not be confused because sometimes we, we uh, associate the mind with the intellectual theory type of mind that lacks direct experience, that lacks verification. That's mostly how we're gonna talk about the mind today. <clears throat> So we in, we're in, we're here for consciousness. That was one of those quotes I was telling you about that's true forever. That's a wonderful quote. Yeah, it is a wonderful quote. Yeah, yeah. And that's our point of departure. And, and also, Master Samuel says that what makes every newborn child beautiful and adorable is their essence. The essence in itself constitutes their true reality. And so that's where we all began in life. We began with a lot of awake essence. And, and then of course we, we grow and we develop and we develop personality and we develop that type of um, thought mind, <clears throat> that theory mind, that ideology mind, that belief mind um, in order to navigate in life in the world. And there's nothing inherently wrong. It's not like that is, is wrong, that's necessary. But do we maintain ourselves as an essence? Do we maintain our connection with ourselves as an essence? And you know, for a, a people, a society, a family, to, to if we could say yes to that, then we would have been meditating in grade school because there would be evidence of the value and the valuing of connection with the essence. The, it would, if we could say yes, yes, we, we, we understand and we comprehend that we are our essential nature and we are an essence and we value that, then it would be reflected. There wouldn't just be conference rooms where we work, there would be meditation rooms. There would be prayer rooms, there would be spaces, and some places of work, there are those, there are those. But it would be more reflected in the way we live life, the way we learn, the way we educate, the way we work, and, and what we do. It would be reflected more in life if we could say, yes, yes, we know that we are essence, we are consciousness, and we are invested in that, and we, we invest in the way we live in the essence, in maintaining our connection to the essence. But how much of that do we really see? It's, it's, it's attempted, it's reached for, it's still valued when we see, for instance, churches, cathedrals, those meditation rooms in workplaces, um, those sorts of things being taught in school more. but is the result that we really know ourselves as an essence. You know, if you, you go ask people in general, well, who are you, what are you? Most people start talking about their personality qualities and also what they do. You know, I am a this in terms of career or profession. You know, I'm in this grade. I am, you know, your, your, your family's last name, your culture. I am of this culture, of this country, of this ethnicity. We talk about things that are not really core to who we are. <clears throat> it's rare to find somebody who would answer that question with qualities of the essence because it's just not what comes to mind. It's not what's first and foremost for most people. And anyway, it's, it's so intimate, it's kind of, um, feels vulnerable to speak in that way. <laughs> so we can think of the essence uh, like, if you've ever worked with, well, we know June, like June, you're, you're very familiar with essential oils, for instance. And I, I don't know, June, if you know, like 
how 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 much of something is concentrated into an essential oil but i remember as i've said to some of you before uh wanting a really pure rose oil which is a very uh divine type of essence the the rose uh we could go into the meaning of the rose we're not going to but 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 what what the person told me was that well it takes almost a hundred roses to get to this little vial of rose essential oil. And, and so in that way, the, the essential nature, the essence is like that distillation, that distillation, you know, concentration of, of what we truly are in a pure way. And then, and then well-made oils, right, June, get really purified, you know, that, that the impurities, the aggregates, uh, the, the whatever would, would constitute as extra matter, dirt, you know, is, is, is removed along the way. And that's really the essence. But again, as, as infants, we come in as more concentrated essence. But then we, as we grow and develop and learn how to navigate in a world where people are generally not really in a living, known, moment-to-moment -moment way, not really living in awareness of being the consciousness and the essence. When we try to navigate in a world where the essence has fallen asleep, the consciousness is largely asleep to what it is, and we try to grasp for a sense of security and okayness and connection through the exterior, or maybe try to <laughs> our poor friends and family and, and significant others, we try to extract that sense of security out of others, like make me feel okay, as if, as if another person possibly could do that for us to replace God, you know, and just and so when we're disconnected from ourselves, and as an essence, we're trying to squeeze it out of others, we're trying to squeeze it out of things like our jobs and proofs of worth, like certificates on our walls, and we're trying to squeeze it out of food and all the dopamine that sensations that might bring and we're trying to squeeze it out of alcohol and drugs we're trying to squeeze it out of experiences vacations whatever and we go from squeeze to squeeze you know trying to get that essential oil feeling back inside of us and and none of that none of the exterior can provide the essence, the feeling of connection to the essence. None of, no one and no thing can do that for us. So we're here in, in, in Gnosis really exploring that. Okay, then how? And these classes on the Gnosis of the human, we're going to continue to explore that. And, right, and today we're talking about like, who are we? Why are we? What's the purpose in being human? And, and fundamentally, where are we? And we're gonna to continue to unfold uh, over uh, several monthly meetings. <clears throat> First, it was gonna be three, and now we're gonna to expand to five, because the last- It's gonna have to be more than we thought. <laughs> That's right, <laughs> so much to being human. <laughs> but, but the first few are kind of laying the foundation, and then the last few are really about, okay, what do we do? How do we do this? And more, more working together and on ourselves. It's actually to understand being human, it's gonna take a whole life. That's, that's the <laughs> right. days. Yes, yes. Yeah, five months, you know, that's not much to <laughs> do this. So we could describe the essence as also a, a spark or an aspect of of divinity, our own internal divinity, the divinity that descends into matter to experience and to know more of creation and oneself as an essence. So we could say that really a fundamental purpose of being human is to re-realize our essential nature within matter which means within our own matter, within our own emotions, within our own sensations, within our own minds, to recognize the essential nature that is core to all of that and not be so distracted and carried away by the attachments and the desires and the aversions 
that can really distract the mind and the emotions and the sensations and to recognize that's not what we are. That's not who we are. And to remember that and remember that and remember that and wake up to the essence that is not just sensations, it's not just emotions, it's not just thoughts and ideas, that's not who we are. And, and, and then it's therefore not the personality that's been fabricated through those thoughts, emotions, and sensations. And in that remembering of our true selves, we call it self-remembering in Gnosis, through that remembering, then we find ourselves you know, at that crux of spirit and matter in all moments. And we recognize that, that here I am at this crux, fulfilling this human purpose of remembering the spirit in matter. Because though a human is an angel in potential, that's part of what we're, we're learning to become, um, we're people we're, when we're people on a planet. You know, it's very literally earthly. It's very material. It's very sensorial. It's a sensational experience. We have emotions. We have this mind that thinks. And yet, it's not who we are. So we, we become found to ourselves. I once, there's a song, right? I once was lost and now I'm found. <clears throat> and through that remembering and refinding of ourselves, we then are impulsed and inspired and motivated to begin to ascend what we call the level of spirit or the level of being, the line of spirit, the line of the being, that vertical line that we want to cross over the line of life so that the line of the spirit or the level of being, the line of the being informs and infuses our material life, including our emotions, sensations, and thoughts, informs and infuses our material life with divine values, principles, and ways of being. And, and then we can have a right to call ourselves human. <clears throat> so via the essence, we, we have conscience you know and and we know when we're feeling our conscience and this is allegorized by uh jiminy cricket and pinocchio right that jiminy cricket is pinocchio's conscience and that chirping conscience you know that <laughs> that at first pinocchio finds very annoying and in the the rather macabre like real original story what happens at first is Pinocchio murders, <laughs> smashes the little cricket <laughs> right off the bat, like scene one, you know, how, you know, in a great story or movie, something exciting needs to happen within the first few minutes. That's what happens in the original story. And he just like right. kills the little guy. And, right. and, and so we know that when we're hearing that chirping of the conscience of the consciousness that is the line of of the being the line of the spirit overlaying over the matter informing the matter we should be led we should be spirit led when we're matter led we're we're in a cycle of what's called devolving which we talk about in other classes so we one fundamental actor or action in gnosis is to really begin to listen to and heed our conscience to get to know what is my conscience and differentiate that from what is fear what is just sensation what is memory of what i've been told what is uh, vanity or fear of what other people think of me what is more learned morals that I don't really know as a conscience, like differentiating conscience, pure conscience, which is <clears throat> intuition, and the, that that we could say divine value of conscience or intuition versus everything else I just talked about and more. 
And, and so at first we're just, we're beginning to listen more. We're beginning to listen with our heart. We're beginning to listen in meditation. We're beginning to listen as we pause in our day and begin to really gain that known sense because it's like a sense that we develop a, a sense of our conscience and listen to that. So that's, that's an important way to reconnect with our essence is to listen to and heed the conscience. Don't smash the cricket, listen to the cricket. It's got some good things to say. It's just that they weren't what Pinocchio wanted to hear for a while <clears throat> until he suffered enough. So the conscience is, or the consciousness is awake to the degree that the essence is aware of itself and active. So we need to activate that conscience, that consciousness, and that essence again and again and again. And no matter how many, the years in, in these kind of studies don't matter. It doesn't matter really like how much you have or have not meditated or chanted or done whatever. What matters is right now. Because even some of the most advanced practitioners and teachers of, of gnosis that we know, they, almost more than anybody, they, the advanced ones, more than beginners, realize they cannot, they cannot take a break. They cannot miss a day of practice. And, and in life, it's, we think the other way around, like, oh, well, you know, if you've clocked in five years of practice, like, just skip a day, take it easy. But actually, in terms of consciousness and be and, and living in this way, the more advanced ones do not skip a day. <laughs> you think they could afford it, but they realize how they can't, you know, we can't. Because the consciousness is only awake as much as it is active in the, in the moment, in the given moment. And any of us can become identified and fall. And I'm going to get into like what it means to, to fall as a, as a master, to fall from mastery, but it happens. And it happens sometimes like that due to becoming identified and submerged in some desire. And someone can lose a lifetime or years of work through that, right? And so it's important that we remember and remember over and over again. And really, commonly, these teachings tell us that we only, as adults, maybe as babies more, that pure essence, but as adults, we commonly have only about 3% of essence truly awake and unconditioned. That's what it means. To be awake is unconditioned. And the other 97% of the time, our, our consciousness and our conscience is clouded, is conditioned, is background thinking, is desiring, maybe struggling not to, like, I don't want to be irritated, but I am irritated, you know, just those states of conditioning that we feel that 97% of the time, give or take, we're in those conditioned states, which is to be more or less asleep. And when we think of it that way, if you really add it up, if you really, really turn, turn the camera on yourself and you really observe what's going on like right now, like what little background thinking is happening, what thoughts, what comparisons, what self-evaluation, what other evaluation, like what emotions that aren't really about this very pure moment, like what all is going on? I think if you really observe it, you will notice that almost all of the time you've got other stuff going on other than what's actually happening in the moment. And that's your evidence that about 97% of the time, your awareness, your consciousness, your presence is conditioned to some degree or another. It's easy, it's easy to verify that. I know at first it seems like a kind of a dismal and shocking statistic, but it actually is kind of normal. It's the way we're generally living. And people think it's intelligent, for instance, to always be thinking, and it's not. 
<laughs> intelligence well, is to be present. I, 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 I asked the question or the challenge, try to stop. Yeah. That's yeah, then you see thinking. where the power is or <laughs> understand what condition conditioning really means. Right. Conditioned to think, trained to think, trained to sense and grasp or avoid, trained to emote and be caught up in that. So we're we're here in these studies to awake from this condition of conditioning, being conditioned. And to fulfill our our role as human beings to be the bridge between spirit and matter, the, the, the shepherd of spirit in matter, and therefore a caretaker of matter, a caretaker of the earth, a caretaker of the other creatures, that to be a human being is, is, um, is a privilege. It's a privilege and not in these classes, but in other classes we talk about like the Gnostic cosmology and, and, the, and the real evolution to becoming a human and what it takes. As the Buddha said, walking uh, along a seashore with some of his monks and he asked, he said, do you know what the chances are of having a human incarnation? Do you know, monks, like what a special opportunity it is to be a human? And, and we'll talk more about like what's so special about that. Because I know it seems like, well, we're the ones killing the planet, unlike the squirrels out in our yard. So how are we so great? But it is awesome, truly, to be a human. It's an amazing opportunity that we are here in Gnosis to learn how to how to live that opportunity in a complete way and, and to fulfill our role, to fulfill our duty really, but to fill our, fulfill our precious opportunity as a human. And so the Buddha said, you know, the chances of having a human incarnation out of all the possibilities are the same chance that the sea tortoise that is out there deep under the water right now will begin to come up for air and the wooden round yoke, like a, like a donut shaped wooden yoke floating on the water will come above her at exactly the time that her head pokes up to grasp that breath of air and she goes back down. That, my friends, is the chance of having a human incarnation. It's a very special possibility for us. <clears throat> And, and what we understand in Gnosis is it's, we have the possibility of being actually human, to become actually human. William Blake is, uh, was, <coughs> was uh, a poet, uh, an amazing artist. So he not only wrote this poem, but he painted this picture or sketched this picture and a uh, philosopher. And we would say a Gnostic, though not necessarily under that name. And he wrote that for mercy has a human heart pity or compassion, really, a human face, and love the human form divine, and peace the human dress. Then every man of every clime that prays in his distress, prays to the human form divine, love, mercy, pity, and peace. So we, we, we are those principles. We are those spiritual values of love, mercy, compassion, and peace in our form. Uh, the potential of our mind is to be containers and expressors of those kinds of virtues and values. The potential of our emotional system is to actually generate more of these qualities in matter, in life. Like we we're, we're potentially a, a love, compassion, generosity, altruism, and peace generator for the planet, other creatures, and each other. Like that's how the human is designed. That's what we're designed to be, to have a mind that understands its true nature and then becomes a brilliant creator of that on earth. But what has the human mind created on earth? It's not all bad, but it's really not all good. 
I think we can see that, you know, with this mind and with these emotions, are we personally and are we collectively creating love, compassion, peace, mercy? Yes and no. <clears throat> yes and no. But it is really our role and our duty and our design to be that. To be that. <clears throat> So as we understand just breaking down what the word human means, hue means spirit, and it is a mantra. It's a wonderful mantra, hue, who, and manas is mind. So a hue man is a spirit mind, a mind that serves the spirit, a mind that is connected with spirit, a mind that is not disconnected from spirit. And so what kind of mentality, mind, or so-called intelligence, intellectualism are we creating? Are we, are we creating a human mind in general in this world? If we think about like how we're educated and what we herald as intelligence in general, are we becoming more or less human in time? Are we evolving? Or are we devolving in terms of what it means to be a human? It's important for us to, to um, really reflect on these things because obviously we have, a, we have an angle on this, a perspective and, and teachings in Gnosis among other traditions. But it's important that we all reflect on this and feel it for ourselves because we're Gnosis has never been interested in being um, a religion in the sense of a belief system that we cling to and just believe in, but don't experience. Either we're here for the real purpose or, or the real meaning of religion, which is religare, which means reunite, relig, ligament, reunite, reconnect, to reconnect to that spirit, that source and that essence. That's the purpose really of religion is to help us to be human, to be connected in that way. Now, what happens is, like I said, we, we need to learn how to navigate life. And if you've ever, if you've ever had the wonderful uh, privilege of seeing a child grow and grow through these phases from that infancy into beginning to develop the personality and take on their personality, then, then you really get to see this. Sometimes it's easier to see from in somebody else than to remember back in our, in our own cases, but it's important that we reflect on, well, how did I navigate? How did I learn how to navigate life? Um, chances are, because you're here, <laughs> chances are, you, you weren't raised in a, in, a, in a family of completely awake consciousnesses and, and weren't educated by completely awake consciousnesses. And you just like dropped in on this class just to grace us with your presence. You know, probably you're here because, because you need some help with this as we all do. And, and so it is valuable to reflect on like, yeah, where did my connection with myself as an essence, like, where did it go as I learned to navigate the world as I was experiencing it growing up? And by about the age of seven, a person has a, a fairly baked personality that then we, you know, tweak and add on to and adjust and uh, depending on our circumstances and our own um, nature, it comes through our in our culture and what is and isn't acceptable in our family and how we you know what we believe it takes to be loved and safe and all of that you know what school we go to and the conditions there and how we begin work and so we certainly make changes to our personality but it's it's pretty founded by the time a child is seven or eight years old and before we begin this work on ourselves as adults we've been largely operating in life, showing up through our personality and, and, and our personality that unless we've really been working on it um, is really 
more informed and directed, guided by sensations, emotions, thoughts, morals, customs, again, what we learned, what we acquired to figure out how to navigate life. And a lot of that is, is ruled by egotistical desire, feelings, ideas, that ego-driven mind, those, those ego-driven emotions. And so this word personality comes from posone, which means mask. And so we wear these masks Sona is related to sound or communication. And so it's how we, how we interface with life and the world around us in order to get our needs met, in order to get, unfortunately, you know, largely our desires fulfilled in our, our, what we don't want away. That's largely how we're utilizing the personality as this interface, this mask. Um, behind which we've forgotten really is the essence. We've generally forgotten that really what's behind the mask, really what's in there is the essence. And we've let the, the egotistical nature or the ego or that conditioned consciousness come in and, and fill the mask. <clears throat> and we have multiple masks. You know, we have different personalities, like the personality, you know, at... Um, a holiday dinner with family might be a different personality than Friday night with your friends, right? We have different personalities that come out. <laughs> we have a Gnostic personality, <coughs> for instance, a spiritual personality. We have different personalities. And so along with um, listening to the conscience and beginning to really notice the difference between the conscience and thinking and and emoting or feeling or fearing, for instance, we also really want to begin to notice what is, what is the personality? How am I acting? You know, when I'm acting, because I'm, I'm to a degree, there's acting with interacting. And what's animating that? What am I trying to achieve? you know, who, who's, whose goal or pursuit am I, am I going for here in this moment using the personality? What am I trying to accomplish in this conversation or in this way of seeing things? And just begin to notice, notice our, again, turn the camera on ourselves and really notice our own personality and, and begin to not just think about, but, but feel into like, as it said, you know, an actor, an actor will turn to the director, like, what's my motivation, you know, and you can turn to your own personality in a moment going, what's your motivation? Like, what are you motivated to, to get or get away from right now? What's motivating the way you show up and the way you interface with your life <clears throat> and begin to know it for yourself. Cause that's what gnosis is about is, is observing, witnessing, comprehending, understanding, having your own ahas. We, give, we get guidance through the Gnostic teachings, but, but it's just guidance. It's just guidance to then go explore for ourselves. So we need to use the awake essence, the conscience, the consciousness that we have in order to observe and comprehend ourselves and begin to not just be this actor, but, but begin to like witness the act and, and grow that consciousness, that observer, the buddhata, the witness, and, and grow that so that that witness, that consciousness, that observer begins to be more present in our lives. And, and we begin to catch ourselves in the act of acting. And the conscience then recognizes like, hmm, I'm not being sincere, I'm not being real, or, hmm, you know, my motivation right now is, is purely selfish. Do I wanna continue wearing this mask or, pursuing this goal, you know, and, and we begin to give 
feeling and life and a heartbeat to our own conscience. And that connects us with our essential nature. We begin to have a real life. Pinocchio becomes a real boy. That was his whole goal the whole time was to become a real boy, but he needed to listen to Jiminy Cricket more and listen to that conscience, the chirping cricket that's always there. <clears throat> So in terms of, um, you know, we've been talking more about who and why we are. And now to talk a little bit more about, um, we could say what, what and where we are. And that we are composed of multiple centers. And, and this is part of our brilliant, beautiful design as a human being. But we need to understand how these centers are being used. So as we observe the act, we observe like, what is this mask that I'm wearing? And, and is, it, is it conveying something true and real and sincere? You know, or is it, and is this an act I want to keep playing out? Is this a part I want to play in life? Well, then it's, it's also important that we understand like how we are made up inside. And I've been alluding to this already, like the sensorial life we have through our instinctive and sexual and motor centers, this emotional interaction and life that we have uh, through the emotional center and this mental intellectual life through the intellectual center. So those are the five like really commonly known centers, the instinctive, the sexual, the motor, the emotional and the intellectual center. And though all of these, it's not just like, oh, it's only here. The intellect is only here, you know, because thoughts move us and move through us. It's not like the emotions are only here in the solar plexus as if it's a thing inside of us. It's a thing in that it's related to the Manipura chakra, which is rooted here in the solar plexus. And that is the seat of emotion in us, lower emotion, because there's also the superior emotional center, which is seated in the heart. And there's also the superior intellect, which is seated we could, on top of the head, you know, which is the crown chakra seat there. And so the, the chakras, which we get into at other times, are, are entirely related with these centers. But we, we have these aspects of ourselves that we want to get to know if we want to awaken. We can't really awaken without knowing ourselves instinctually in terms of movement and action and impulses. We won't, I mean, my goodness, like how could we know ourselves if we don't know ourselves sexually? I mean, that is like what we come from. The sexual energy is what we are most fundamentally of all things, energetically and physically. <clears throat> and so any religare, religion that, that absences a real understanding of sexuality and the sexual energy and how to, um, work with and relate with our sexual energy in a way that has the line of spirit informing and infusing matter and all of its sensations and desires with divine principles, with divine values and virtues. If sexuality is not included, it's, it's, it's a gravely incomplete teaching. I mean, it makes sense, right? Like, how could you know yourself without this aspect <laughs> being a very uh, deep part of what we're talking about? And then we can't really know ourselves if we don't know what's going on in our emotional center, or obviously in our mind or intellectual center. So it's important that we understand how we are composed, how we are designed, and to begin to observe ourselves and it doesn't, it, it can be one at a time, like I'm just going to observe myself and my instincts. And that could be a really useful exercise to begin to differentiate, like what are instincts? Like how am I experiencing them? Or 
emotions because even people who are highly emotional can be very disconnected from their emotions because they're so, because they're so infused with emotional sensations, they actually lose touch with what they're really feeling or what the real need is. For instance, somebody who is angry and raging all the time, they're very out of touch with their core of fear and vulnerability that's motivating that anger and rage. So they're not emotionally in touch just because they're emotional all the time. Some of the most emotional people are the least emotionally att attuned people actually. But then there's people who don't know how they feel and don't know if they feel very disconnected emotionally. So, so it helps us to, yeah, know that we're emotional beings and to become fluent in our own emotions. And likewise with our mind, become fluent and aware of what is happening in the thinking mind, because there it is going. We are thinking most of the time. And unfortunately, most of them, what, what you know, studies have shown is that most of our thoughts are repetitions. 90 something percent are fundamentally the same thoughts we had yesterday. So we're wasting a ton of mental, of, of energy on repeating. We don't have a lot of pure thoughts. It, life doesn't really require that much thinking. It doesn't. Our granddaughter, the other night, she sleepwalked and we have, what we have is in our little compressed Seattle space is a bed loft and it's got a ladder. And, um, she sleepwalked and like climbed all the way down the ladder, went and used the bathroom, got like a drink of water or something. She washed her hands. That was washed the first thing hands. she wanted to do. I happened to be in the bathroom at the time, <laughs> right. which was kind of bizarre. <laughs> Not quick enough to get my camera out to record the whole thing because it was adorable. Because <laughs> you want to show this ridiculous. to her later for sure. <laughs> but anyway... She did all that in sleepwalking. She didn't remember the next day. He had to show her the video to prove it to her. You know, we don't need to think to do a lot of what we do day in and day out. We really don't need the intellectual mind for that much at all. But when we need it, you know, we need it. And we, rather than being this like worried, dispersed, confused, overused, tired center, if we learn how to think less, it becomes more brilliant. More thinking definitely doesn't make us more brilliant. More thoughts, 90 something percent of which are repeats, does not make us more brilliant or smarter. Cleaning our mind and giving space allows for more brilliant thinking, original thinking, creative thinking to arise. And meditation is a fundamental necessity to learn how to do that. So understanding how we're composed and also that we have a superior emotional center seated in the heart that is that hub and that magnet and that generator of love, mercy, compassion, peace, altruism. Those, we could say divine, but we don't differentiate. We don't think of divine, we don't, um, we understand that divine is not just outside, but it's inside. So it's not like some divinity comes in and, and, and inputs the stuff into you. <laughs> that, that when the heart is open, it becomes natural to be a receptor, conduit, and generator of superior emotions, what we call superior emotions. And again, that's part of our job as people, as humans, is to be that on the planet. Because other creatures, other animals, though they have such a purity that we need to learn from, like dogs, you know, they're more, they're very enslaved by their senses and they can't really be otherwise. And so a dog looks to a human as a master, relates to the human as a master, because we are designed to be a master on the planet and not an, not an abusive master, but a shepherd, a caretaker, a gardener. We're designed for that. This brain with these emotions and this physique is designed for that, designed to do beautiful things on the planet. We are exactly designed for that. And the superior intellect, of course, <laughs> resting at the crown chakra, this 
we become a receptor, a receptive antennae towards heaven through that superior intellectual center that's symbolized by the upturned empty Buddha's bowl. Empty, not full of theories and ideas and thoughts and memories and culture and morals, empty is, is the proper state of the mind to, to be receptive <clears throat> to that creative thought that we never thought before. I'm gonna kind of blow, we don't need to do that. We'll talk about this in the future. I'm gonna move through that because I wanna get to practice. <laughs> Pre-work. I wanna get to practice, which is <clears throat> really about this. being who we are, where we are in the moment, this crossing of spirit and matter. And I want us to um, continue to observe this in our daily life. We're gonna take a, a few minutes break now. And I want you to, to just observe what we've been talking about as we take this five minute break before the meditation practice, that, that you are here as this cross point between spirit and matter and try not to think about it but just sense and feel yourself as that know yourself as that so it's a daily life practice and then we're going to also take it into a meditation practice so let's take about five minutes let's we'll start again at at uh, 35 whatever your clock 10 35 pacific time we'll start again and, and have about a 20 minute meditation together okay so we'll see you in five So just finding your way of relaxing. And now find your way of breathing. Notice that you are breathing first. And at first notice how you're breathing. maybe more shallow, maybe more deep. And if you're breathing in a shallow way, let that prana, that air, that inhale, reach further down into your lungs without pressing, without creating tension, without pushing. <clears throat> it's as if your belly invites the breath down. and lets the breath in. So you're not literally breathing into your belly, but when you're taking in a fuller inhale, your belly does expand because that diaphragmatic muscle above it pushes down to make way for that air. And not just air, but life, prana, light. And as you're letting your inhales be deeper and longer, let your exhales be longer and more complete to their end. So you're finding the length of an inhale and the length of your exhale. And relax mentally relax psychologically don't think too much about your breathing it's something you've been doing without thinking most of your life so just while having longer inhales and longer exhales be natural be relaxed
And now to help us to really engage with the practice, stay with it, but also to move energy through our systems, our body and its systems in a helpful way. Begin your next breath with the exhale. So exhale all of the air out and begin the next inhale as if at the bottom of the spine and inhale as if up the spine into the brain. Take a pause at the end of that inhale and then exhale slow and long into the heart. Take a pause at the end of that exhale as you begin again at the base, the bottom of the spine. Inhale long and up as if up the spine. Pause, pause between the eyebrows with your imagination. Being full of breath and then exhale into the heart. Pause at the end of that exhale as you return again to the original point at the base of the spine and cycle your breathing, cycle energy, cycle your imagination, your mind, staying with the practice, staying with your breath in this way on your own for a few breaths. And now with your next exhale into the heart, remain with your awareness, your focus in the heart, as if you just breathe into and out from your heart, or this area of your heart. We could say this hub of our humanity, our humanness, this main point of reception and emanation of what it really means to be human, spirit mind, and all the possibilities and potential of our beautiful humanness, our beautiful humanity that are received into and generated and emitted from the heart. Breathing in and out of the heart, becoming centralized there, very familiar. We wanna to learn to dwell and live in our hearts.
And you can imagine a candle flame in the center of your heart. That flame of the essence, that spark of divinity inside your heart. that flame that gives light and warmth to all that you are, that flame that gives light and warmth to others, that brings light and warmth into your life, into your mind, your way of being, that can illuminate your way of feeling, your way of acting your way of moving. And allow your heart to feel its natural yearning to live in and from that light, to really know yourself, to feel yourself as that spark of the divine in your life, in your body, experiencing your body as the body of this essence the spark of the divine, experiencing your mind as the mind of this spark of the divine. To be behind the mask and inside of yourself, knowing your true nature, your simple nature, natural joy, peace from within, acceptance, contentment, Joy for the joy of others. A very natural happiness. Let your heart long to feel the true nature of what you are. Simple heart, simple mind, simple body. Yearn for this, pray for this. In non-thinking, feel for this. Essential nature, pure nature, infant-like nature. And with this feeling, as much as you can have of it in your heart, imagine 
that essence animating your personality, your thoughts, your moods, your actions today in the day that you might live as you can imagine it, the things that you believe you will do, the people that you intend to see, the things that you plan to live today, imagine yourself moving, speaking, thinking, feeling, acting from this place of simplicity, this place of longing to stay connected to your essential nature. Imagine emanating through the mask these natural qualities of the being of spirit of generosity, a peaceful nature. Contentment. Courage. Imagine your personality, your way of speaking, moving, acting, behaving, being animated by your essence today. We can do what we can imagine. because all of creation begins in the imagination of a person, of a God. And now letting go of that vision, that imagination of your day ahead, come back to simply breathing into and out from your heart. Come back to your breath. Come back to this moment. Come back to your body and notice how you feel. Notice your presence. Notice your breathing. And the mantra, especially related with the heart, is Om. So let's end this practice with three Ohms and a feeling of appreciation, a feeling of gratitude. Oh.
So as you're ready, bring movement back to your body, open your eyes, we'll come back together to end as a group.